My name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 14. With our book today, because there's no co-host today, we're going to cover, well, this book. And if you're looking at the video, you can see it. Anton Chekhov. We're going to look at three selected stories from Chekhov, and we're going to talk about the leadership lessons that you can get from reading those three stories. He was significantly less dour than Dostoevsky, who was about two generations older than him, and less expansive in ambition maybe than Tolstoy, who actually knew him quite well. He believed that quote unquote, people might go on reading my writing for at least seven years after I'm dead, which was fine for him. For at the time of making this statement, he would only have six years to live after being diagnosed with tuberculosis. Considered to be one of the few truly great writers of Russian literature in the 19th century. He died a year before the 1905 revolution that set the stage inexorably, as history often does, for one of his fans, Lenin, uh, not John, by the way, to really kick off the big revolution in 1917. By the way, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov once infamously said after reading Chekhov's short story, Ward 6, and I quote, reading this story would make anyone a revolutionary. And so today we are going to look at three short stories from Anton Chekhov, and we're going to hit three beats. Now, they're not his most famous stories. And then from then we're going to, and that's why, by the way, they're good. And then we're going to tease from them three big leadership insights uh, and leadership lessons that will seem to come from completely innocuous places. from In the Court by Anton Chekhov, one of his short stories. But as the saying is, too many cooks spoil the broth, and probably that is why the house strikes, oppresses and overwhelms a fresh unofficial visitor with its dismal barrack-like appearance, its decrepit condition, and the complete absence of any kind of comfort, external or internal. Even on the brightest spring days, it seems wrapped in a dense shade, and on clear moonlit nights, when the trees and the little dwelling houses merged in one blur of shadow, seem plunged in quiet slumber, it alone absurdly and inappropriately towers, an oppressive mass of stone above the modest landscape, spoils the general harmony, and, and keeps sleepless vigil as though it could not escape from burdensome, burdensome memories of past unforgiven sins. Inside it is like a barn and extremely unattractive. It is strange to see how readily these elegant lawyers, members of committees and marshals of nobility, who in their own homes will make a scene over the slightest fume from the stove or 
stain on the floor, resign themselves here to whirring ventilation wheels, the disgusting smell of fumigating candles, and the filthy, forever perspiring walls. The sitting of the circuit court began between 9 and 10. The program of the day was promptly entered upon with noticeable haste. The cases came on one after another and ended quickly, like a church service without a choir, so that no mind could form a complete picture of all this party-colored masses, faces, movements, words, misfortunes, true sayings, and lies, all racing by like a river in a flood. By two o'clock, a great deal had been done. Two prisoners had been sentenced to service in convict battalions. One of the privileged class had been sentenced to deprivation of rights and imprisonment, and one had been acquitted. One case had been adjourned. The life of Anton Chekhov and the death of Anton Chekhov is reflected in his writings, and he was born a Capricorn in 1860, for whatever that's worth. His father was a devout Orthodox Christian, a director of the parish choir, and tyrannical in his abuses with both people and money. His mother, on the other hand, told stories and provided and nurtured the heart and soul of the family. Our talents we got from our father, Chekhov remembered later on, but our soul from our mother. He sang at the Greek Orthodox monastery in his town of Tagorong and was held back for failing an examination in ancient Greek. When his father eventually went broke and was betrayed in a bad business deal, Chekhov was left to finish his education, settle the family debts as best he could, and then began reading the best that Western Europe had to offer. The young Chekhov started writing biting satires at first. He then proceeded to go to medical school and qualify to be a physician, which would be significant later on. And then, to top it all off, had his first run-in with tuberculosis, just for good measure. Now, before long, Chekhov began attracting popular attention as well as literary attention and received the first good advice in his literary career that he would receive over a short literary career from one of his peers. His peer told him to slow down write less, and concentrate on literary quality. Back to In the Court by Anton Chekhov. The assistant prosecutor, a fat, well-nourished, dark man with gold spectacles, with a handsome, well-groomed beard, sat motionless as a statue with his cheek propped on his fist, reading Byron's cane. His eyes were full of eager attention, and his eyebrows rose higher and higher with wonder, 
From time to time, he dropped back in his chair, gazed without interest straight before him for a minute, and then buried himself in his reading again. The counsel for the defense moved to the blunt end of his pencil about the table and mused with his head on one side. His youthful face expressed nothing but the frigid, immovable boredom which is commonly seen on the face of schoolboys and men on duty who are forced to sit day to day in the same place to see the same faces, the same walls. He felt no excitement about the speech he was about to make, and indeed, what did that speech really amount to? On instructions from his superiors, in accordance with long-established routine, he would fire it off before the jurymen without passion or ardor, feeling that it was colorless and boring, and then gallop through the mud in the rain to the station, thence to the town, shortly to receive instructions to go off again to some other district to deliver another speech. It was a bore. At first, the prisoner, who they just had brought out, turned pale and coughed nervously into his sleeve, but soon the stillness, the general monotony and boredom infected him too. He looked with dull-witted respectfulness at the judges' uniforms, at the weary faces of the jurymen, and blinked calmly. The surroundings and procedure of the court, the expectation of which had weighed so much on his soul while he was awaiting them in prison, now had the most soothing effect on him. What he met here was not at all what he could have expected. The charge of murder hung over him, and yet here he met with neither threatening faces, nor indignant looks, nor loud phrases about retribution, nor sympathy for his extraordinary fate. Not one of those who were judging him looked at him with interest or for long. The dingy windows and walls, the voice of the secretary, the attitude of the prosecutor were all saturated with official indifference and produced an atmosphere of frigidity, as though the murderer were simply an official property, or as though he were not being judged by living men, but by some unseen machine, set going goodness knows how or by whom. Leaders and this is the first lesson that we can pick up from In the Court by Anton Chekhov. Again, I would encourage you to go out and pick up this short story. I would encourage you to take a look at it. Leaders need to have their eyes open because what Chekhov is talking about in this story, in this short moment, and we're just pulling selections from these stories and then talking about them and teasing ideas from them. The thing that leaders need to pay attention to and that leaders need to be aware of is the banality of duty and the calcification of systems. Not only an act of tyranny, which we can all see when a tyrannical system begins to crumble like the Soviet Union did in 1987, 88, and 89, um, but also in passive tyranny as is represented in the story. The passive tyranny of the building, the passive tyranny of the people, the passive tyranny of the prosecutor and the defense attorney, the boredom and the ennui, the banality of duty in a system where meaning and, I love what Anton Chekhov says here, passion and ardor have gone out of the system itself. There are hints here uh, Chekhov was born in 1860, so there are hints here at the depth of blindness of Russian culture as the transition from serfdom to a firmly Western European class-based structure was beginning to occur, right? We're at the beginning of a new thing. I mean, uh, Chekhov's own father had been a serf. He was not that far away from what basically in Russia was chattel slavery. And, and even then, the system was beginning to lose its will. 
There are also hints at an idea that Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Dostoevsky would explore first earlier in Dostoevsky's time and then later in Solzhenitsyn's time on the back end of the horror of the gulags of the Soviet Union um, in a day, one day in the life of um, Ivan Denisovich, or of course the gulag archipelago. There are hints in, in the court by Chekhov of the openness to the idea of a gulag based system not to actually get justice, but to alleviate boredom. Because if at least you're tyrannizing somebody else, you're not gonna be bored and you're definitely gonna be passionate. Chekhov's writings and Chekhov's approach and perspective, just like the writers who came before him, but in a more delicate manner, explored the narrative of the drift of blindness in a post-serfdom environment. And it was a drift in Russian culture towards blindness. He wrote honestly in, in the court and in many of his other writings about the banality of institutional boredom, not in large ways, which is where everybody looks for it, leveraging small world, large, not small, large world bending narratives, right? He wasn't seeking to do that like Tolstoy was. Instead, he was trying to show the depth of, of institutional banality and blindness in small ways through community, family, church, or work that every participant in the culture of the world has a part to play in battling. And if you're a leader, every leader has a responsibility to lead on correcting if they see that it's wrong. in a post-serfdom society and culture, we're going to take a turn to a different piece of writing from Chekhov. So we're going to move from in the court to in the home. Uh, I want to read you a selection from Vanka by Anton Chekhov. Vanka Zhukov, a boy of nine who had been for three months apprenticed to Alehin the shoemaker, was sitting up on Christmas Eve Waiting till his master and mistress and their workmen had gone to the midnight service, he took out of his master's cupboard a bottle of ink and a pen with a rusty nib, and spreading out a crumpled sheet of paper in front of him began writing. Before forming the first letter, he several times looked round fearfully at the door and the windows, stole a glance at the dark icon on both sides of which stretched shelves full of lasts and heaved a broken sigh. The paper lay on the bench while he knelt before it. Dear Grandfather Konstantin Mar Mar Makarich, <laughs> he wrote, I am writing you a letter. I wish you a happy Christmas and blessings from God Almighty. I have neither father nor mother. You are the only one left to me. Vanka raised his eyes to the dark icon on which the light of his candle was reflected and vividly recalled his grandfather, Konstantin Makarich, who was a night watchman to a family called Zhivarej. Sorry, it's not Zhivarej. It's Zhivarev. He was a thin but extraordinarily nimble and lively little old man of 65 with an everlasting, everlastingly laughing face and drunken eyes. By day, he slept in the servant's kitchen 
or made jokes with the cooks. At night, wrapped in an ample sheepskin, he walked around the grounds and tapped with his little mallet. Old Kashtanka and L, so-called on account of his dark color and his long body like a weasel's, followed him with hanging heads. This L was exceptionally polite and affectionate, and looked with equal kindness on strangers and his own masters, but has not a very good reputation. Uh, politeness and meekness was hidden in the most Jesuitical cunning. No one knew better how to creep up on occasion and snap at one's legs to slip into the storeroom or to steal a hen from a peasant. His hind legs had been nearly pulled off more than once. Twice he had been hanged. Every week he was thrashed till he was half dead, but he always revived. Chekhov was sensitive, as most artists are, to the impact of negative emotion. Um, on the big five factors of personality, he would probably be ranked as being high in anxiety or neuroticism. And I'm not using that as a mental health diagnosis. I'm just saying he was sensitive to negative emotion and highly open to experience. But the problem with being sensitive to negative emotion and being quite lyrical in the documentation of small things is that when you are actually confronted with the lived results of blinkered tyranny, blind bureaucracy, and willful individual arrogance, well, you might come to the wrong conclusions. In 1890, at 30, Chekhov undertook an arduous journey by train, uh, horse-drawn carriage, and river steamer to the Russian Far East to visit a penal colony on Sakhalin Island. And uh, when he arrived there, he began interviewing uh, convicts and settlers for a census. He witnessed many things while he was there, Anton Chekhov did, and uh, these things included, well, all the things that you would expect to go on in a penal colony or maybe someplace like North Korea, a country that's a penal colony. He witnessed floggings, embezzlements of supplies, and forced prostitution of women. He witnessed human degradation, the destruction of little children's dreams, and he began to question the totalizing ability of systems to provide justice and mercy. And he began to believe and write more and more in all sorts of subtle ways about the governmental duty to finance humane treatment of convicts. And of course, because at the time Chekhov was an official medical doctor, um, his work as a medical doctor, back when he got back from Sakhalin Island, his work with, as a medical doctor brought him into contact with everybody up and down the ladder of class hierarchy in a post-serfdom Russia, from peasants to aristocrats. And he noted in his journals, and I quote, aristocrats? They are the same ugly bodies and they have the same physical uncleanliness, the same toothless old age and disgusting death as with market women.
to Vanka by Anton Chekhov. Vanka sighed and dipped his pen and went on writing. And yesterday I had a wigging. The master pulled me into the yard by my hair and whacked me with a boot stretcher because I accidentally fell asleep while I was rocking their brat in the cradle. And a week ago, the mistress told me to clean a herring, and I began from the tail end, and she took the herring and thrust its head in my face. The workmen laughed at me, and the workmen laugh at me, and send me to the tavern for vodka, and tell me to steal the master's cucumbers for them, and the master beats me with anything that comes into his hand. And there is nothing to eat. In the morning, they give me bread for dinner porridge and in the evening bread again but as for tea or soup the master and mistress gobble it all up for themselves and i am put to sleep in the passage and when their wretched brat cries i get no sleep at all but i have to rock the cradle dear grandfather show the divine mercy take me away from here home to the village it's more than i can bear i bow down to your feet and I will pray to God for you forever. Take me away from here or I shall die. Vanka's mouth worked. He rubbed his eyes with his black fist and gave a sob. I will powder your stuff, your snuff for you, he went on. I will pray for you, and if I do anything, you can thrash me like cider's goat. And if you think I've no job, then I will beg the steward for Christ's sakes to let me clean his boots, or I'll go for a shepherd boy instead of Fetka. Dear grandfather, it is more than I can bear. It's simply no life at all. I wanted to run away to the village, but I have no boots, and I am afraid of the frost. When I grow up big, I will take care of you for this and not let anyone annoy you. And when you die, I will pray for the rest of your soul, just as for mommies. Moscow is a big town. It's all gentlemen's houses, and there are a lot of there are lots of horses, but there are no sheep, and the dogs are not spiteful. The lads here don't go out with the star, and they don't let anyone go into the choir, and I once saw a shop window, fishing hooks for sale, fitted ready with the line, and for all sorts of fish, awfully good ones, there was even one hook that would hold a 40-pound sheet fish. And I have seen shops where there are guns of all sorts, after the pattern of the master's guns at home so that I shouldn't wonder if they are a hundred rubles each. And in the butcher shops where there are grouse and woodcocks and fish and hares, but the shopmen don't say where they shoot them. <sighs> Leaders need to understand that the tyranny they seek to face out in the work world or the world out side can only be undone once they address the chaos in their own homes first. Many times leaders at work are asked to perform at their stellar best while experiencing chaos in their personal lives and growing in self-awareness as a leader is intimately tied in with effectiveness in all the areas where leadership acts may seem to be innocuous in that clip in that section we read from the short story vanka vanka is being led astray uh, being led astray by adults being led astray by society and culture being led astray by his own appetites and desires being led astray by many different factors and no one is leading him in the right direction particularly not in the home where he serves. When leaders don't hold back the chaos in their own homes, when they fail to be good leaders at home, um, and when the results of that chaos, when the chaos itself breaks the dam, leaders at work are often encouraged, particularly nowadays in times of mental health due to uh, you know, pandemics and social isolation. Leaders are now being asked to, uh, are being encouraged to be a little bit more open than they were in the past, where they would have been told to just button it up and suck it up, buttercup. And on the same track, they lose brownie points, right, for not being transparent 
or authentic with their people. And then, of course, the epiphenomenon of fake transparency and pretend authenticity is replicated out across social media, not only by leaders, but also by their followers and everybody else in our culture now. Almost, what is it, 140 almost 150 some odd years post checkoff this epiphenomenon is replicated across our digital systems with aggregated experiences in the highlight reel of a curated life a carefully curated life because you don't want too much truth or too much transparency or too much authenticity out there leading at home and leading at work are not the same thing that's not what i'm saying and I don't believe that by long chalk, but they both present leadership challenges and how leaders face those challenges, how leaders address those dichotomies between who they are at home and who they are at work. Well, how they address that closes the gap between work and home. It unites a leader as an individual person in one body showing degrees of difference in different places, but basically the same. Whether a worldwide pandemic scare forces you as a leader into leading remotely or not. Leaders need to get real with themselves, with others, and with the culture. Speaking of getting real with yourself and getting real with the culture and well, getting real with the gap between what you've got going on internally as a leader and what may be going on externally in the environment you're leading, and of course the gap between what people expect of you and what you can provide. In the space of getting real, we want to read from our third selection entitled, interestingly enough, A Play. Yeah, that's right. I know, I know, I know. Chekhov wrote a ton of plays. This one's called A Play by Anton Chekhov. It's an interesting little ditty about authorship, leadership, and, uh, well, murder, most foul. But murder from boredom and ennui. Pavel Vasilevich. There's a lady here asking for you, Luca announced. She's been waiting a good hour. Pavel Vasilevich had only just finished lunch. Hearing of the lady, he frowned and said, Oh, damn her. Tell her I'm busy. She's already been here five times already, Pavel Vasilevich. She says she really must see you. She's, she's almost crying. Hmm. Very well, then. Ask her into the study. Without haste, Pavel Vasilevich put on his coat took a pen in one hand and a book in the other, and trying to look as though he were very busy, he went into the study. There the visitor was awaiting him, a large, stout lady with a red, beefy face and spectacles. She looked very respectable, and her dress was more than fashionable. She had on a crinolette, four stories, and a high hat with a reddish bird in it. On seeing him, she turned up her eyes and folded her hands in supplication. "'You don't remember me, of course,' she said in a high, masculine tenor, visibly agitated. "'I, I, I had the pleasure of meeting you at the Hrutskys. I am Mademoiselle Marushkin.' "'Ah, uh, <clears throat> what can I do for you?' 
You, you see, I, 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 the lady went on, sitting down and becoming still more agitated. You don't remember me. I'm Mademoiselle Marishkin. You see, I'm a great admirer of your talent and always read your articles with great enjoyment. Don't imagine I'm flattering you. God forbid. I'm only giving honor where honor is due. I'm always reading you, always, to some extent. I am myself not a stranger to literature. That is, of course. I will not venture to call myself an authoress, but s still, I, I have added my little quota. I, I have published at different times three stories for children. You have not read them, of course. I have translated a good deal, and, and, and my late brother used to write for The Cause. Uh, to be sure. <clears throat> what, can I, uh, what can I do for you? You see, the lady cast down her eyes and turned redder. I know your talents, your views, Pavel Vasilevich, and I have been longing to learn your opinion, or more exactly, to ask your advice. I must tell you I have perpetrated a play, my firstborn, pardon pour l'expression, before sending it to the censor, I should like above all things to have your opinion on it. Nervously, with the flutter of a captured bird, the lady fumbled in her skirt and drew out a fat manuscript. Pavel Vasilevich liked no articles but his own. When threatened with the necessity of reading other people's or listening to them, he felt as though he were facing the cannon's mouth. Seeing the manuscript, he took fright and hastened to say, Very good, very good. Leave it. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. We pause here for a note on... A play uh, from the short story project. Uh, why this story is worth your time. A few words written by, uh, I don't know if it's a researcher or somebody over there, but uh, a gentleman named Roy Chen. I want to give credit where credit is appropriately due here. And uh, old Roy has this to say about Anton Chekhov's A Play. I'm going to read extensively from his words here. And uh, of course, I've annotated and backlinked those words in the podcast notes below the player so you can go check them out yourself madame maraskin or maraski being the russian word for shivers is a budding playwright who wishes to read her new play to pavel vasilevich a renowned author seeking his critique but her name alone or by her name alone it is clear what the listener feels during the reading the short comic piece a play was first published in 1887 in the periodical Oskolki, which means fragments, under A. Chekonote, one of his many pseudonyms. This text was written by a very young Chekhov, he was around 27 at the time, a brilliant uh, Fueletonist, and I'm mispronouncing that terribly, F-E-U-I-L-L-E-T-O-N-I-S-T, the author of the Vaudevilles, his short plays, and of short stories that won him great acclaim. Now, Leo Tolstoy, interestingly enough, loved this story. He was a 60-year-old post-religious conversion man of letters by the time of its publication, and even told it countless times and always, quote-unquote, laughed wholeheartedly. The year Chekhov wrote this story, he also wrote his first big play, Ivanov, establishing himself as a serious playwright. Shakespeare wrote, All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. And while that is accurate, some players appear on the world stage. Some players who appear on the world's stage are also playwrights. And they are not all as successful or boastful as young Chekhov. Just look at Madame Marashkin. Chekhov's approach to writing for plays and for the stage was very, very simple. And he developed this over the course of many, many years. Um, and it's a principle that can really help leaders to understand uh, not only leadership, but also to understand their lives. Um, every element, and this was his approach, every element in a story must be necessary and irrelevant elements should be removed. Elements should not appear to make quote unquote false promises by never coming into play. In essence, if a writer is going to reference a loaded rifle, or pretty much anything else in a play, it had better have a purpose. It was called, this rule, that is, was called Chekhov's gun. 
Now, this became so ubiquitous um, that by the time Ernest Hemingway was writing as a young man in Paris, it became a rule that was almost reductio ad absurdum, meaning that Hemingway thought it was funny as a young writer to introduce two characters as consequential and then have them never referenced by any characters ever again. These days, almost 100 and 40 or 50 some odd years later, in our post-literate era, Chekhov's rule is violated left and right in streaming services, uh, streaming shows, streaming movies, uh, Hollywood and YouTube produced films, and even podcasts. Well, maybe not podcasts. <sighs> Moving on. In March 1897, Chekhov suffered a major hemorrhage of the lungs while on a visit to Moscow. The doctors told him he had severe tuberculosis in the upper right part of his lungs and was well on his way to being terminal. And because when it rains, it pours, Chekhov's tyrannical, abusive, cowardly, and wayward father went to meet his heavenly reward just a year later after that diagnosis in 1898. After his father's death, Chekhov, at 38, began doing all the things he probably should have gotten around to doing earlier when he was a much younger man. He bought a pot of, brought a pot of, <clears throat> he bought a pot of land. <laughs> That's right, a pot full of land. No, he bought a plot of land, and he built a villa, and he married an actress, a woman named Olga, who was just as shifty and as unreliable as any play character Chekhov ever came up with, and despite being horrified of living in actual domesticity, which by the way he didn't, he lived with his mother and his sisters, he began writing some of his best work, some of the things that we know him, some of the writing that we know him the best for in times of great stress and on the downhill slide of a very short very sensitive life. He died in 1904, and his body was transported in a refrigerated railway car, which the writer uh, Maxim Gorky kind of had a real problem with, uh, and it because it was a railway car meant to carry oysters. He was carried all the way to the cemetery, and he was buried right next to his wayward, abusive, and very orthodox father. What are we to take from Chekhov's gun? Well, it doesn't all come together until you get to almost the end of the tale with Pavel Vasilevich and Madam Moroskin. Back to a play by Anton Chekhov as we turn the corner here and 
Spokane on the downhill slide of our podcast today, looking at three selected stories from Anton Chekhov. Pavel Vasilevich, the lady said languishingly, clasping her hands and raised them in supplication. I know you're busy. I know your every minute is precious. I know you're inwardly cursing me at this moment, but but be kind. Allow me to read you my play. Do do be so so very sweet. I, I, I should be delighted, faltered Pavel Vasilevich. But madame, I'm I'm busy. I'm I'm obliged to sit off this minute. Pavel Vasilevich moaned the lady, and her eyes filled with tears. I'm asking a sacrifice. I am insolent. I am intrusive, but be magnanimous. Tomorrow I'm leaving for Kazan, and I should like to know your opinion today. Grant me a half hour of your attention. Only one half hour, I implore you. Pavel Vasilevich was cotton wool at core and could not refuse. When it seemed to him that the lady was about to burst into sobs and fall on her knees, he was overcome with confusion and muttered helplessly, Very well, certainly, I, I will listen. I will give you a half an hour. The lady uttered a shriek of joy, took off her hat, and settling herself, began to read. Now, if you go read a play in the Anton Chekhov selection of short stories, you'll read a little bit of the lady's play, and I'm not going to go into the madame's entire Play. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in the selection and go to this. Pavel Vasilevich listened and thought with yearning anguish of his sofa. He scanned the lady viciously, felt her masculine tenor thumping on his eardrums, understood nothing, and thought, The devil sent you, as though I wanted to listen to your tosh. It's not my fault you've written to play, is it? My God, what a thick manuscript, what an inflection! During the 16th scene, Pavel Vasilevich yawned and accidentally made with his teeth the sound dogs make when they catch a fly. He was dismayed at this unseemly sound. To cover it assumed an expression of rapt attention. Scene 17, when will it end, he thought. Oh my God, if this torture is prolonged another 10 minutes, I shall shout for the police. It is insufferable. But at last, the lady began reading more loudly and more rapidly. And finally, raising her voice, she read, Curtain! Pavel Vasilevich uttered a faint sigh and was about to get up. But the lady promptly turned the page <laughs> and went on reading. Act 2, scene, a village street. On right, school, on left, hospital. Villagers, male and female, sitting on the hospital steps. Excuse me, Pavel Vasilevich broke in. How many acts are there? Five, answered the lady, and at once, as though fearing her audience might escape her, she went on rapidly. Valentine is looking out of the schoolhouse window. In the background, villagers can be seen taking their goods to the inn. And on, and on, and on. Like a man condemned to be executed and convinced of the impossibility of a reprieve, Pavel Vasilevich gave up expecting the end, abandoned all hope, and simply tried to prevent his eyes from closing and to retain an expression of attention on his face. The future, when the lady would finish her play and depart, seemed to him so remote that he did not even think of it. Now the writer, Chekhov, goes on and writes a portion of the play as a sample for all of you readers out there, and so I would recommend going in getting the short story and reading it or you can go check it out online just to follow the links that are in that are below the podcast player and then we turn the corner towards the end the lady began swelling again looking around him wildly Pavel Vasilevich got up yelled in a deep unnatural voice snatched from the table a heavy paperweight and beside himself brought it down with all his force on the authoress's head Give me in charge. I've killed her, he said to the maidservant who ran in a minute later. The jury quitted him. You can see why Tolstoy thought that was funny and probably Jerry Seinfeld and anybody else who's ever created anything and had to deal with the amateurs. I'm reminded, of course, of Harlan Ellison's entire rant which you can check out on youtube 
pay the writer. It's the amateurs that kill you. And Chekhov knew it. Chekhov was a prophet. He was a prophet of a new form of writing. And uh, in his prophetic voice, he was also the prophet of many things that were, many cultural things that were about to come down in Russia. Uh, the after effects and the knock on effects of those events we still live with today. Of course, like I said, he had a lighter touch than Dostoevsky, and he wasn't nearly as world bending as Tolstoy. And leaders need to pay attention to this lesson. Leaders who are prophets usually get reassessed after they're dead. Leaders who are martyrs almost never get reassessed. And leaders who walk the line between those two points usually struggle the most. Chekhov decided to be a prophet, and for leaders, the consequence of not picking a path can lead to either career death or some other consequence that will do until career death arrives. Now, most people, most leaders listening to this will say, well, I didn't get that from a play. Yeah, maybe you didn't, but here's an idea you might want to consider. Desiring to be a legend, to be a comeback king, to be the G-O-A-T is fine, but it's better to let actual history move forward and avoid as much as possible the reductio de absurdum of the ever-present now, for history will prove to be a harsh and unforgiving judge. From Chekhov's gun, right, all the way to Chekhov's life, right, from his tyrannical abusive father um, and his mother who gave him stories and a soul, all the way to the men like Tolstoy that he ran into who inspired him to keep on going, to his, from his uh, adventures and from his observations as a medical doctor, all the way to his writing of Russian cultural norms that were beginning to be redefined during a period of time between serfdom and, well, Marxist totalitarianism. Anton Chekhov showed us the way to go forward, the way to stay on the path, and he did it in ways that were subtle, that were non-obvious, and that, quite frankly, Many folks who uh, critiqued him during his time didn't really understand or accept. As a matter of fact, in Chekhov's lifetime, Irish critics, echoing the thoughts and opinions of many with less Irish courage than they had to speak up, generally did not appreciate Chekhov's literary efforts. The Irish author and linguist E.J. Dillon gave this assessment, and I quote, The effect on the reader of Chekhov's tales was repulsion at the gallery of human waste represented by his fickle, spineless, drifting people. The Irish journalist and author R.E.C. Long said, and I quote, Chekhov's characters were repugnant and that Chekhov reveled in stripping the last rags of dignity from the human soul. Turns out that the Irish literati back in the day really liked their own writers. 
and even those ones not so much. You can either be a legend, you can be a prophet, or you can be a martyr, or you can maybe just be a creative. But there are three big lessons, right, that Chekhov teaches leaders, which I want you to take at the end of listening and watching me for the last 40 some odd minutes. Three lessons from Chekhov's writings. Lesson number one, leaders need to have their eyes wide open to the decline of systems. But it's not just enough to see the system declining. It's not just enough to to document it like Chekhov did so brilliantly to write it down and do nothing about it. Instead, leaders must have a plan to address tyranny when it arises rather than, like in the story in the court, just being cynically accepting of the circumstances. The cynical pose that hides a lack of ability to take responsibility isn't going to work to build anything. Point number two, leaders need to address the chaos in their own homes first, even before they get to the chaos outside, right? Before they get to fixing the totalitarian or tyrannical external systems, they've got to make sure that they don't have a totalizing tyrannical system internally and close the gap between what they show to the public and what they don't so that there's no mismatch or misalignment in word or deed. Think about it. Think about the leaders you like. You like leaders who are rock-ribbed. You like leaders who know themselves. You like leaders who are total people. Yes, they have degrees and shades of difference, but they're not politicians and they're not bureaucrats. They're leaders. Leaders seek to unify all of their faces into one identity. Last point, point number three, in order to stay on the path, leaders can serve as prophets or martyrs, as I said before, but there are consequences to treading both paths and leaders have to be clear about which path they are treading and why. It doesn't mean they have to be loud about it. It doesn't mean they have to be extroverted about it. Introverts can be prophets and introverts can be martyrs, just the same as extroverts can, right? Fact of the matter is leaders have to make a decision. You can't split the difference, right? And you have to be intentional, speaking of which, you have to be intentional and aware of what it is you're doing and why it is you're doing what you're doing. When we think about Anton Chekhov, he sits as a writer in this weird middle ground between Dostoevsky and um, and. And, and Tolstoy, right? He sits in this weird, odd place, and most individuals find his work more accessible than either one of those two titans' works, but they also find it to be a little bit more humbling and a little bit more intimate. And thus, Chekhov is a person who has been lumped in with Jane Austen, uh, Virginia Woolf. Um, he's been lumped in stylistically with Maxim Gorky and uh, Turnigev, uh, Nabokov, and many others, right? But Chekhov is Chekhov, just like Tolstoy is Tolstoy and Dostoevsky was Dostoevsky. He defined a culture, but he defined a culture in the drawing room. He defined a culture in the chattel house he defined a culture in the penal colony he would as his fan lenin would later remark he would make you feel as if you were there because he wanted to pull something out of you he wanted to make sure you knew what was going on he wanted to make sure that you were more than just informed that you would take action And leaders take action in order to stay on the path. And that's it for me.